Amen. Well, listen, let's get into John 4 today. And uh, John 4, we're finishing up this chapter. Uh, and uh, if you're newer with us, we've been just taking the book of John, which is one of the four accounts of Jesus' life. There are four different accounts of Jesus' life. One was written by a man named Matthew, one written by a man named Mark, one written by a guy named Luke, and one written by a guy named John. And John was a disciple of Jesus. John walked with Jesus for three years, saw many different things. Uh, just real quick, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were all written earlier in time after Jesus died. Their accounts were written sooner. John's account is very different, and I believe that as John was one of the disciples who were not martyred, probably lived into his 90s, right? Even though he was persecuted and exiled on the island of Patmos, whatever, most people believe that he saw that there were some stories missing in the other three accounts and said, hey, I want to share some of these things. I want to write these down because he saw that. So in John 4, we're going to read the second miracle of Jesus that's in the Gospel of John. And, and, and again, there's eight miracles in the Gospel of John. Most of these miracles are not in any other story. So before we read this today, um, we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the unity in this church, the love in this church. Thank you that we got to gather and celebrate and remember, Jesus, what you did. Lord, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we love you for that. And now as we look to you, Jesus, when we look to what you did when you were on this earth, God, I pray that your spirit would grab a hold of our hearts. I pray that you would encourage us today, and I pray that we would be able to apply this story, this remarkable story to our lives, and I pray that it would give us hope today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Luke chapter 4, we are in verse 46 as we finish out this chapter. Verse 46. Again, many of you know, in the beginning of Luke 3, Jesus was in southern Israel. He was traveling to northern Israel in Galilee, and he passed through Samaria, met with this woman and the Samaritan people, and we, we talked about that for the last three weeks. He continues up to Galilee, uh, and then this is what it says in verse 46. It says, so he came, oh, hold on one second. I, thank you very much for helping me out there in the back. It says, so he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he made the water into wine. Remember Jesus' first miracle, John chapter 2, Jesus turns the water into wine in this town called Cana, which is about 20 miles outside of Galilee, right? And then it says, so he came there again. And it says, and at Capernaum, it says there was an official whose son was ill. And the man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee. And he went to him and he asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And he was going down. His servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And the father knew that was the hour when Jesus said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all of his household. And this is now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. All right, so here's where we're going to go today, okay? We're going to take the first part, just talking about Jesus and looking at what he's done, see his power, see his glory, and then we're going to take the second part, and we're going to look at this man, this official, right, who went to talk to Jesus, okay? And, and I want you to see, right, this is not just a miracle. It is a miracle, right? Je this man comes to Jesus. The man's son is sick. Not only is he sick, he's dying, right? This official probably has lots of resources. He can't get Get his son to feel any better. There's no hope. So he searches out Jesus. We're going to get to that, right? And then Jesus speaks a word of healing to this man. Go, your son will live. We later read that it was at the exact hour when Jesus spoke the words that the son was here. It's a miracle, right? It's amazing, right? The power of Jesus's words. But I also want you to see just the power and the reality of a promise, right? Because Jesus is a great promise maker. 
I mean, just think about this. I mean, here, here's this, this struggle that, that, G, that this man's going through, this grief of, is my son going to go be okay? Uh, I, I, am I going to be able to see him tomorrow? And he's searching out Jesus, and Jesus says, go. Listen, trust me, your son is going to live. And the man turns around and trusts the promise of God. And listen, we need to remember today that Jesus' promises are trustworthy worthy today. Now listen, I understand, right, especially, right, I mean, I think it's ironic whenever we talk about promises during an election time, right, because do you guys know what percentage of people actually trust political promises out there? I did a little research. They say that the average, that in a survey, only 4% of people actually trust politicians' promises. Can you believe that? Only 4%? Some of you guys are like, yeah, I believe it, right, right, because all of us struggle to believe it, right? Now, now let me just give you this for a second. Out of respect for our political leaders and our officials who we need to pray for, and I'm thankful for what the weight and the leadership that they take on. Do you know that it statistically says that when you go back and you look at what political people say, what they're going to do, most of the time it's anywhere between 60 and 70 percent of what they promise they accomplish. And we understand there's two sides of the aisle. We understand that there's, you know, different judicial and legislative and executive branches that all trying to work together. So sometimes it's not just on the person, but, but they actually keep, I mean, that's pretty good stat, right? 70%. They keep their promises, right? But how much do we know? It doesn't matter. Even if they keep 70%, whenever someone breaks one promise, we struggle, right? I mean, if someone says, you know, is, is faithful every day, showing up at work, showing up at work, showing up at work, and then all of a sudden they break a promise, or they don't show up, or out of the blue, they're just off the mat. It only takes one promise to break our trust, and every one of us has had our trust broken before. Every one of us have had people in our life that have said certain things and then they haven't kept their word, right? Isn't that the reason why we, when, whenever you do something big, we sign a contract, right? Whenever you buy a house, you sign a contract. You lease an apartment, you sign a contract. If you get a new job, you sign a contract. Why? Because we don't trust people's words anymore, do we? I mean, it's not like back in the day where people would just have a handshake, right? And they would shake a hand and say, you know, my word is my bond. And, and they would hold to that. Today, it's not like that. We struggle to trust people. You know, back in the day, people trusted people. You know, there's a story of Abraham Lincoln. Do you know, many, many people don't know, or maybe you do know, that Abraham Lincoln was totally, he always totally abstained from any sort of alcohol. Never drank at all. Do you know why Abraham Lincoln never drank at all? Well, once there was a colonel who found out because this colonel in the military came up to Abraham Lincoln one day when they were hanging out after, you know, whatever, and he offered Abraham Lincoln an alcoholic drink, and he said, here you go, you know, Mr. President, and he goes, uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't want that. He said, why not? He said, because when I was nine years old and when my mom was dying, she looked at me and she said, Abraham, I want you to promise one thing. Don't ever drink a drop of alcohol. And Abraham Lincoln said, okay. And, and to, to that moment and forever on, he said, I will never drink a drop of alcohol because I made a promise. And do you know that colonel replied to him and said, I am so sorry. I don't want you to break that promise. And he goes, wow, I would give $1,000 if I could keep a promise like that. You know, we, we, we struggle keeping promises sometimes, don't we? They're, they're rare. They're stories to hear because so many of us, we break promises. But you know what? who keeps a promise greater than Abraham Lincoln? That's Jesus Christ because Jesus is God's son. Jesus and God are one. And when Jesus says something, it happens. When God says something, it happens. It says in Numbers 23, I love this passage. I encourage you, memorize this passage. It says, God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should change his mind. God has said it, he has said it, and will he not do it? Or he, has he spoken it, and will he not fulfill it? Listen, when God speaks a promise, it's going to happen. And Jesus embodies that in his life. And so Jesus' trustworthy promises, let me just share a couple things here. One is that Jesus' promises transcend time. Sorry, I don't know where that slide is. It transcends time and location. That first line is they transcend time and location. The words of Jesus, right? They're not bound to this location. 
This man is, is 20 miles away. This son, Jesus hasn't seen him, right? It's, it's a long walk. It's, a, it's probably a full day's journey over many hills. But yet Jesus speaks a promise. This boy, this son will be healed, and he was healed. Think about many of the other words and the other healings Jesus said. This is one reason why this is different. Listen, Jesus touching someone's eyes and they're healed. Jesus pulling up the lame man, right? Jesus commanding the dead to rise, right? Jesus was there in every situation. And when he spoke those words and even those words of healing and promises, he was there. Even remember when Lazarus first died and Mary came to him and said, Jesus, if you were here, he would not have died. But in this situation, Jesus said, I don't have to be there. I'm going to speak a word, and he's going to be healed. And I'm going to speak a promise, you go, your son will be healed. Because Jesus' promises transcends over time, and they're worthy to be healed, trusted. They transcend over location. And Jesus' words not only transcend location, but listen, Jesus' promises, they hold power and authority. I always say, all of our words have a certain degree of power, right? Whenever words come from all of our mouths, right, our words can encourage people. Our words can bring judgment. Our words can bring joy. Our words can bring fear. Our words can scar, put down, build up, bring direction, right? Words are spoken all over the place, and they have power to alter our lives, But how much more the power of Jesus' words and of Jesus' promises, right? When Jesus declares something, it happens. I mean, I was just thinking for a second, just the power of Jesus' words. When Jesus just said the phrase, take up your mat and walk. And someone who was lame for 30-some years started to walk. When Jesus declared, go wash in the pool of Siloam, and the blind man could see again. How about when Jesus said, stretch out your hand to the man whose hand was withered, and and all of a sudden his hand stretched out and was, was set free from that infirmity? How about when Jesus spoke to the storm, peace, be still, and all of a sudden peace just, it just stopped automatically, right? How about when Jesus said to the demon possessed man, demon come out of the man, you unclean spirit, right? These powerful words, Lazarus, come forth, right? And here we go, Jesus speaking five powerful words that change this man's life. Go, your son will live. Wow. And where does that power come from? Why does Jesus have this power to be able to speak over not even bound to a location? And when things happen, why is that? Because Jesus has an authority so much greater. Because Jesus said, I and the Father God, we are one right? And so when Jesus, when God is Lord of all over all things, Jesus is Lord of all, right? We know that Jesus created all things. And as it says, Jesus holds all things together. He is Lord over every single molecule in that boy's body, right? And he has that authority. And because of that authority, right, Jesus can speak these words and that boy it's healed. See, this is why sometimes we can read these, we read these miracles and we can just take them for granted. And we don't recognize the authority that it takes someone to be able to speak a word like that, a mir- miracle, and for it to happen. Now, when we pray for people's miracles, right, we don't do it in our own authority. We do it in the authority of Jesus Christ. And when it happens, it's because it's a testimony of Jesus Christ, which we're going to get to in a little bit. But Jesus spoke words. His promises are words of power and of authority. And the last thing I want to say about Jesus' promises and power is that this. It says, listen, um, sorry, my slides are out of order today. It says, listen, Jesus' promises, uh, are, are they endure forever. They endure forever. Jesus said some of the most powerful words in Matthew 24, 35, when he says, heaven and earth will pass away but my words will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. All the promises that Jesus ever spoke to our lives, they'll they'll never pass away. They're forever. Do you know why that gives me hope and encouragement? Because as much as I've gotten so much help and so much strength in my life by the power and the promises of Jesus Christ, I know that they're for my children. I know that they're for my children's children. I know that they're going to last forever because he says, listen, heaven and earth are going to pass away before any of my word ever stops 
um, you know, my word will never pass away. So when Jesus spoke the words and said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, right? I'll never change. When Jesus spoke the words, listen, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. That's a promise that's going to last forever. When Jesus spoke the words and said, whoever abides in me and I in him, he is going to bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Listen, those are promises that last forever. And when Jesus said, listen, you will be baptized in the Spirit. You're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit. You're going to be my witnesses. That's a promise that's going to last forever. We need to recognize Jesus. These promises are always there and faithful. As it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, it says that all the promises of God are yes and amen. Yes and amen. And so we see Jesus just in this awesome awesome place of his promises being yes and amen. I hope and pray that you trust that. I hope and pray that you see that through Jesus Christ you have access to these promises. Because if you don't see that you have access to these promises, you'll never grab hold of them. You'll never take advantage of them, right? And this is where we're going to now transition and just look at this man, this official, right? I mean, in the notes, I, I wrote this Roman official. As I did some more research, he, he could have probably been a, a Roman official. Of the word official means little king. There's a chance that he might have been a, um, uh, just a, a Jewish official. You know, we're, we're not 100% quite sure. But, but listen, I can tell you this, that he wasn't going to church. He probably wasn't bi reading his Bible. He probably wasn't trusting in Jesus. He had lots of resources as he's this high up official. But he knew his son was dying. And he knew that he didn't have the answer. And so this is where we go back to the story. And, and I want to read it again. It says, and at Capernaum, verse 46, it says, there was an official whose son was ill. And when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and he asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So again, what did this, what did this man do? He sought out Jesus, right? He sought out Jesus. He didn't just stay at home. He just didn't do anything. But he stopped to say, listen, I, I, I heard of this man named Jesus, and I have no way to heal my son. And so he went from the Capernaum, which is about 20 miles away. Listen, and he tried seeking and finding Jesus. Let me tell you, how hard do you think it was to find Jesus back in their day? Do you guys realize that when this was written, there was no GPS devices? Do you guys know when this was written that he couldn't pull out his phone and text somebody and say, hey, have you seen Jesus anywhere? Do you know that he couldn't find Jesus on Facebook and say, hey, Jesus, where are you at right now? Do you understand that this Galilee area, that he, he heard Jesus came to the Galilee area, that is probably the size, you know, that region, probably the size of Berks County roughly, maybe a little smaller, but it's a big area that's called the Galilee area. And, and so he's got to go seek Jesus. Listen, maybe he found him in a day. Maybe it took longer than a day, right? But he was like, I need to find Jesus at. And, 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 and it's interesting because I encourage you, are you seeking out Jesus to touch your life in the areas that you need healing, in the areas that you need the promises of God? Are you seeking Jesus? Let me ask you, why are you here today? Why are you watching online? I, I, are, are you possibly because someone just asked you to come? Maybe it's because this is what I do every Sunday, right? Maybe it's ingrained in us. Maybe we feel like it's our duty or, you know, you know, I made a promise to someone. I hope it's more than that. I hope it's because you're here today. I hope you're watching online today because there's something in your heart. And I believe this. I believe this is you. That there's something in your heart that says, you know what? I want more of Jesus in my life. I am seeking a touch from Jesus. Maybe someone's seeking a healing touch from Jesus. Maybe you're seeking direction. Maybe you're seeking a word from Jesus. Maybe you're seeking for that path and that direction. Where do I go or, or a purpose, right? Listen, this is a good thing. If we don't seek out Jesus, we won't find anything, will we? I mean, I'm amazed at this story. What would happen if this Roman, this official, whoever he was, what would happen if he would have just stayed home? most likely his son would have died. If he does nothing, most likely his son dies. But he said, I'm not going to let that be. 
I'm going to do whatever I can. I'm going to go on a search and rescue. I'm going to go search out Jesus. I'm going to find him. He's in Galilee area. I'm going to ask people, have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? He's over. He went down south. Okay, I'm going to head down south. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? He's in, uh, he's in Cana. Okay, go to Cana. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? I mean, Cana's bigger than Birdsboro. I'll tell you that. At least when, we, when I went in December, it's a decent city. Have you seen him? He sought him out. And when he sought him out, he found him. Listen, church, we must push forth. We must get desperate at times when seeking Jesus, right? Just like this man did. He sought him, and he found him. And when he found him, let me tell you what else he did. He humbled himself to Jesus. He humbled himself. Listen, again, he's a royal official, right? Listen, this was someone who, who was, had people answering to him. And if he answered to anybody, he probably answered either to Caesar or he might have answered to King Herod, right? He had servants. He had, lead, he had leadership and authority over people. Let me tell you, most likely this official and Jewish rabbis, they did not get along. They were on different sides of the aisle, okay? They had different political views, most likely, in that time. And yet this person was not afraid to humble himself and come to Jesus because he knew his son needed a miracle. And let me ask you this question. Why did Jesus heal the man? Did he heal this man because this man had a lot of money? I don't think so. Did he heal this man because this man had a lot of political pull and that Jesus was doing some little side deal with him from a political standpoint, right? I don't think so. Remember when Jesus you know, turn the water into wine. Jesus wasn't even swayed by his own mother's request. Woman, what do you have to do with me, right? Jesus was, was only focused on doing the will of his father. But I'll tell you what motivated Jesus to heal this man, son. Because this man humbled himself, that's why. These words that, he, that we can read here in verse 49 says, the official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Sir, right? Sir, that, that word represents you have authority over me. That word represents humility. That word represents respect. That word represents I'm coming to you in humility right now. I'm not forcing my way. I'm not trying to manipulate you in any way. Sir, would you please come before my child dies? dies. Let me just tell you really quick, church, humility always moves the heart of God. Humility always moves the heart of God. Money doesn't. Pushing and pressure doesn't. Making promises to God, I'll, I'll do this, God, if you just do this, then I'll do, I'll do whatever you want. No, that doesn't move the heart of God. Humility moves the heart of God. It says two different times in the New Testament, it says, God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. And when we have come, right, we, we need to not come with pride. We need to come and humble ourselves before him, seeking the Lord Jesus, and he it will move the heart of God always. I think it's really interesting that seeking and humility are always tied together, aren't they? Because doesn't it take humility even just to seek something out, right? Doesn't it take humility just to ask, right? Like seeking, they're, they're always tied together, right? If we're seeking God for something in our life, that we need humility at the exact same time. Let me just ask this question real quick. How many of you, think about this, how many of you ever wanted prayer for something, wanted God to do something in your life, wanted to come down maybe and pray or whatever, wanted to talk to someone about your faith, but you were too scared or too worried about what somebody was thinking about you and you didn't do it. Anybody out there bold enough to raise your hand and say, I've been there once or twice before. Come on, raise your hand, keep it up. Look around the room, right? We always struggle with it. You're not alone, right? And so it takes humility, doesn't it? To humble ourselves and to come and seek Jesus. They're tied together. It takes humility to even bow a head. It takes humility to, to fold a hand or raise a hand. It takes humility to get down on our knees in prayer at different times. But it's humility that moves the heart of God. And this man came to Jesus in humility. And I encourage you, I know as I'm talking about this today, maybe there's some things that already are stirring 
in your heart. Maybe there's some things that you need in your life. Maybe there's some things that you're desperate for right now in your life. And I would say, listen, seek Jesus. And I would encourage you, grab hold of humility. The lie, listen, Jesus speaks promises over our life. The enemy speaks lies over our life. The enemy loves to whisper thoughts. Do you realize what people are going to think of you if you pray, if you ask for help, if you read the Bible, if you go and talk to that person, if you accept Jesus into your life? Do you know what people are going to think of you, right? And, and that's all pride. It's all stirring up pride. I can't, I can't have people think of me like that. But when we humble ourselves and we say, I don't care what people think. I just want one thing. It moves the heart of God. Let me tell you, this official who was known by a lot of people, maybe people looked down on him for going to see Jesus, but he got his son back. He got his son back. Humility always moves the heart of God. I just want to keep reading here. Verse 49 and 50. So the official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. And I love this little phrase here. And the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. Listen, this man sought Jesus. This man humbled himself. But this man believed and obeyed Jesus. Listen, I I was going to put these as two different points, believing and obeying. Listen, believing and obeying always go hand in hand. You can never separate them. He believed. He, he walked away, right? He, he said, I'm going to trust that these words of Jesus. See, I, can, I started out talking about the promises of God, but I ask you today, will you believe the promises of God? Will you live your life knowing those promises are for your life? Will you live every moment saying, I know I got the promises of God with me. I know I can go to him. I know I can seek him. I know he's going to answer. I know he's going to walk through this. I trust the promises of God. Listen, just with, with where am I at? How are you walking away from the church? for seven weeks and taking a rest. Because I believe the promises of God. This church belongs to Jesus Christ. He's the pastor of this church. I'm not. He's in control of this church. I'm not. So I can rest in that because I believe the promises of God. What do you need to believe in? Right? I mean, let me just tell you how much faith this, this took. And, and maybe this, like, hit me because I was so thankful to, there's some of you in here too. You know, we, we got to go to Jerusalem and, 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 and Israel in December, back uh, December of 2019. And so I was able to be in Capernaum. I was able to be in Cana. I know the distance between the two. I know the bus ride we took up and over the mountains, different places, right? But I'm just thinking to myself, like, can you believe how much faith It must take a man who maybe sought Jesus for two or three days, who's worried, anxious, sick about his son dying, who hears words of Jesus when he says, go, your son will live. And he goes, okay, I'm going to believe. He didn't say, Jesus, can I have your cell phone number? He didn't say, Jesus, can I text you in case we have another problem? He didn't say, Jesus, if I go back and something isn't quite right, how can I get a hold of you? He doesn't say, Jesus, um, you know what, on your way back, do you mind stopping at 223 Court Street or wherever he might have lived, right? He believed and he went back to his family. And church, God is looking for people who believe the words that he speaks. God is honored. God is glorified. God is lifted up when we are a people that say, if God said it, he's going to do it, and I trust it with all my heart. I trust it with all my heart. And we can believe, and whenever we believe, we obey. Jesus said, go. Go. That was a commandment. You go. Promises your son will will live. All right, I got to go. I have to obey. I have to walk in it. And obedience and belief and faith in Christ are always linked together. Why don't we obey God sometimes? Because we don't believe. And why are there times where we are stirred up and we're like, I'm following and I'm listening to what God wants from my life? Because our faith is strong in those moments. And we trust, if I, if I do what God asked me to do, he's going to be with me and bless me. Believing and obeying are always tied together. And this man did that in this story. I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward. As they come forward, let's listen. You know me, I just want to finish this story out and read it together. I love the ending here too. It says here, it says, as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. Thank you, Jesus, right? 
And so he asked him the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And the father knew that this was the hour when Jesus said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and his whole household believed. Just love how, how these stories, these complete stories in, in, in these accounts of Jesus' life, how not only do they show the glory of Jesus, not only do they show, this story shows the power of Jesus, his words, his miraculous ability, not only does it show just who he is in God, right? Not only do we see even this man just walking in obedience, this man's desire and longing for his son to be healed and searching Jesus and finding him and humbling himself, right, and obeying, right? But I just love, right? I mean, it's so similar to the story we just read, right? They see this miracle of Jesus happen. They see the son better. Not only was he better, but it was the exact hour when Jesus spoke it. And, and it says that he believed. Now, now, I thought he already believed once because he listened to Jesus and he went, but no, something deeper, a deeper belief, not just, okay, Jesus, I believe and I'm gonna go, but in his heart of hearts, he goes, this Jesus, he must be God's son. He must be the Messiah. He must be someone different than just some prophet or good person. It says they believed. I believe with all my heart, this means they believed in Jesus as the Messiah. You know what, I just wonder, you know, maybe John saw this man at another time. Maybe John, you know, as he traveled and different crowds came around Jesus, maybe John saw this man again. Maybe this man came back and, and probably, right, because how else would John know this, right? This man probably came back to one of other, Jesus' other gathering. Hey, Jesus, listen, my son, remember I met you over in Cana and you said, go, listen, he, he actually had happened, right? And I believe in you, Jesus. I want to follow you, Jesus, and not just me but my whole family as well. We're all following because we've seen your goodness. Let me just tell you that when we see Jesus' promises fulfilled in our lives, when we see Jesus' promises fulfilled in other people's lives, when we see Jesus working and moving, let me just tell you, it ignites our faith, doesn't it? It ignites our faith. We have these moments where we struggle, Jesus, where are you? But when we see God moving, it ignites our faith. We were praying for a family to, uh, this week who needed a place to live. They were searching for months at the 11th and hour, the final moment, right? They found a place to stay. God answered their prayer, right? God is faithful. He answers his promises, right? He will provide. It ignites our faith. And I encourage you, I encourage you, look around. Where do you see Jesus' promises being fulfilled? Where do you see Jesus be just being true to his word? I encourage you, don't overlook it. Don't glaze it over. Don't just say, okay, whatever, but celebrate it and know it. God is still moving and God is still working. And there are people today in this land and around the world who will see the move of God and they will, they will pursue it and they will be part of it and they'll run with it. And sadly, there will be people who completely ignore it. They turn their head away from it, and they don't want to see it. And I encourage you, may that not be you today. May you look at the work of Jesus Christ, what he's still doing in people's lives. And will you continue to just shout it, right? God is a promise keeper. Jesus is a promise keeper. He's a miracle worker. And I know that he is faithful my life and he can be faithful in your life just call on him reach out to him seek him humble yourself obey him believe in him trust him fully with your life because Jesus can change your life do you believe that Jesus is still changing lives today listen I had someone step in my office last testimony real quick I had someone step in my office last week something like this I can't tell you details but something like this pray for a friend. He needs a touch of Jesus. Okay, we'll pray. And they said this. He says, because I've seen Jesus touch another friend of mine. And this person was so far gone, there was no hope. And the only reason this person's life has changed is because Jesus Christ. And therefore, I know 
My other friend needs Jesus the same way because that is this person's only hope. And as he said that, it just resonated in my heart. Yes, Jesus, you do change lives and you will continue to change lives because you are a promise keeper. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Will you stand with us today as we close? further here today, I just want to take a moment. There's moments that we need to humble ourselves and we need to come to Jesus. I just want to take a moment. Maybe you're here today. You're hearing these words of Jesus Christ. You're hearing these words of power. You're hearing these words of miracles. You're hearing these words of life change. And there's something in you that says, I wish Jesus could touch my life. And I'm here to tell you, he can. All you need to do is open your heart up to it. So what I would ask, is there anybody here that would say, Devin, I want to open my heart to Jesus Christ. I want to make him Lord of my life today. Is there anybody here that would just say, Devin, would you please pray for me because that's me today. Anybody here today, that would be you today. Anybody here, I just feel in my heart, we just need to stop and ask. Anybody here today that would say, I just want to rededicate my life to Jesus Christ. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your word today, for what you're doing. We thank you for your promises. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you still heal lives. We thank you, Lord, that you still bring restoration. Lord, we thank you that you are still in the business of cleaning up our messes. Jesus, we thank you that you're still in the business of working, Lord, in impossible situations. Father, I thank you that sometimes when we have nowhere to go, Lord Jesus, we have to go to you. May we go to you quicker, Lord. And may we see your working power. Jesus, I ask and I pray. Lord, move in this place. Move in this place in Jesus' name. Listen, the worship team's going to play in a little bit, but before they do, I just feel in my heart, how can we as a church sit and hear this story and not be moved by it? Maybe you're here today and you just say, Devin, I, I just need a fresh touch of healing. Or, Devin, I just have something in my life right now that it just seems impossible. Devin, there's something I'm desperate for right now. And I just, I'm just wanna, I just want to grab a hold of Jesus. I just need a, a touch and a move of Jesus Christ. And listen, if that's you, I'm just going to ask you to be bold. Just come down to this altar. We want to pray for you. Is there something that you're desperate for? Is there something? Listen, this man sought out Jesus. Right? This man humbled himself, right? This man believed and obeyed. Maybe there's someone here today, you're, you're going through that. And I just want to say, listen, come on down here. We want to pray for you. You can put a mask on if you want, spread out. We got lots of room here. We just want to take time to speak the words of God over somebody's life. And I don't care if one person comes down or 10 people come down. I want to take time to pray today. So if that's you, will you just make your way forward as the worship team starts singing? Go ahead, worship team. You just come forward today.